Time Team has come to Rycote Park in Oxfordshire to try and find the remains of a great house which once played host to five reigning monarchs. The most spectacular of these occasions must have been when Queen Elizabeth I came here on a state visit. She'd have walked down this driveway, past the stable block, and believe it or not, all of this was the stable block. She'd have had to have crossed a moat, and once she was in the house, would have been escorted to a banqueting hall, where she'd have been lavishly entertained. And this is where the great house should be. And we've got just three days to find it and unlock its secrets. Today, that stable block's been converted into what seems to us to be a very smart house. But 250 years ago, it would have been dwarfed by the palace that stood somewhere down this garden. That palace is thought to have been destroyed by a great fire in 1745. So we've come here to help the current owners find where this great house would have stood and how much of it still lies buried under their lawn. We have these two prints that are only 12 years apart and they are totally different. This one is the late 17th century and this one is the early 18th century. And we would very much like to find out what happened um, as it all burned down in the 18th century. Leo, is there much evidence of this house still around? Uh, there's very little physical evidence because um, of the fire and it's, it's destroyed, but there are vast amounts of masonry that just appear all over the estate in different places, but in particular in the meadow, um, behind the ruin here, where the house is shown. The drawings they've got are a snapshot in time. We know the early 16th century was a time of great activity in building. The great royal palaces such as Hampton Court were being built. This was a house of the upper gentry. There's part of it that survives over there. I'm just going to have a look. Yeah. See you in a bit. Uh, Gabby touched on something quite interesting. The difference between the, those two prints, which are quite close together in date, are telling us that this site can tell us a story. It wasn't simply built on a virgin site, then just remained unaltered. It's quite possible would have been built on a site where there was an earlier house and it is quite likely indeed we'd be very surprised if it wasn't expanded after that building of the early 16th century as well so there's a story here so if we get the trenches in the right place we could see various layers of this house building that's right we need to get a couple of trenches in straight away we need to i think establish where the frontage is perhaps find out where the entrance is which will because of the symmetry of the house uh, enable us to arrange uh, in, our, in the reconstruction of the front and also we need to find out where the back of the house was so a trench over there would be good too this engraving of Rycote by Johannes Kipp clearly shows the stable block and the ruined tower, the only part of the estate that still survives. We're going to be looking first for the moat that surrounds the house, then we'll know where the house is. And we'll also be searching for debris from the house that might have been dumped there after the fire, because moats are good for finding rubbish. John's surveying the garden where the house would have stood. His first goal is to locate the northwest tower and the moat that would have run along the back of the house. We can then use the geophysics results and Kip's engraving to focus our search. Robin and Royal Palace's guru Simon Thurley have also been studying the Kip engraving. I thought you'd be fascinated by this front bit here, but you seem more enthusiastic about this jumble of buildings at the back. Well, that is the interesting bit, because it's obviously a whole range of buildings put to accommodate the court and the king or the queen, whoever's coming to visit, and those are very interesting. We know very, very little about that sort of building. Mm -hmm. But is there anything in this front bit that we could find that would get you excited? Oh, sure. It'd be very nice to see the hall. The Great Hall, obviously, is the largest, the most important building in the house. We don't know whether it's of the same date, the 1520s, or whether it's perhaps slightly later, which is what I suspect. It could have tiled floors, beautiful stained glass. Robin, do we know who built this house? Well, up until this morning, everybody thought that it was Sir John Heron, who was uh, a very famous treasurer, both to Henry VII and Henry VIII. But it turns out that he didn't really actually live here. So we're either forced earlier or later. So, Simon... What kind of uh, date would you put on that facade? How early could it be? I wouldn't want to go a year earlier than 1500. And in the other direction? How late? It 
Couldn't be a year later than 1530, I'd say. 1530 is your absolute limit. Well, that, uh, that solves it, <laughs> in essence. In, in because uh, it has to be the chap who was here before, a chap called Sir Richard Fowler, who was known as the spendthrift which suggests that in building, or starting to build, this palatial establishment, he beggared himself and was forced eventually to sell up. I mean, the, the other grand thing about this house, literally grand thing, is uh, because it was such a massive place, it attracted successively Henry VIII on his honeymoon in 1540 with Catherine Howard, his fifth wife, uh, and successively Queen Elizabeth and James I and Charles I. This was the kind of place that could, on a regular basis, accommodate any part of the court that was moving between London and Oxford or vice versa. Well, what exactly did you find out here then? Well, we were putting some drainage in, coming across here with a digger, and we caught, caught some brickwork. Brickwork? Until we Phil's following up another lead. He's been talking to Eddie, the estate manager, who thinks he may have accidentally found part of the Tudor house. He knows where it is, but not what it is. But he has a theory. Knowing the area and about the mansion, now, I thought it's probably the bridge that goes into the mansion. Do you reckon you can find a brickwork again? The brickwork would probably be... Somewhere. Good Lord. There. Oh, oh right. That seems like it there. That sounds solid, doesn't it? Oh, we can get that out. You got an easy life, Eddie. I was told to stand here and watch over you, and that's <laughs> exactly what I'm doing. If Phil can find Eddie's bricks, and they do come from the bridge that led to the main entrance, that should find the front of the house. No, 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 I have to go in there. Stuart and local archaeologist Julian Mumby are examining the ruins and comparing what's left of the building with the facade shown in Kipp's engraving. If the picture's accurate, they should also be able to tell us where to dig to find the main entrance. This is the front, front wall That's right, coming with through the, um, here. Yes. And I've been measuring the, the bays, the width oh. between the bits of surviving architecture. To get the fragment. proportions across the front. And this is the midpoint, or near enough the midpoint. What? What about this? as a possible edge of a doorway. That's the front door. <laughs> I mean, this is a brick, it's a brick building yeah. with stone edgings on it. Mm. And here's the brick wall coming along. And there is a, two stones on top of another. That makes a wall, doesn't it? <laughs> in terms of measurement, this should be where the front door yes. is. But in that case, the bridge into the front of the house should be just across Straight the Straight there, yeah, not, not over and there. they're digging over there. <laughs> Nobody's had the heart to tell Phil yet, but if Stuart's right, it means Eddie's brick structure can't possibly be the bridge leading to the front door. Let's get some more of this out here and start trying to get some contour on the top of the, on the, top of the dome. Tudor houses like Rycote were built symmetrically, so the entrance would have been midway along the front wall of the house. Our first priority is to put a new trench in by the garden wall to check Stuart's theory. Geophysics are trying to locate the northwest tower at the other end of the garden to help us establish the length of the house. But there's one slight problem. Yes. Yeah. So that's oh, right. We've got where some the results. Oh, they look good. They're fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. Yeah. The problem yeah. that John's just made me aware of is yeah. the corner point here where the tower's most likely to be uh, is right bang under underneath tree. that tree. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. All we've got is the tree roots. I mean, it strikes me that the strongest thing we've got here is this line coming yeah. along here, which is presumably the other side of the courtyard, of which that tower is standing on the front there. Yeah. That seems to be our best target now. The question is, is this the front or the back wall of that range? In other words, are the internal rooms this side or that side? If we put a trench across it, we could work that out, hopefully. And or, try and clarify the relationship between that. That's right. Load. There's a great low there, possibly an infilled water feature. If we put a trench across all of those... Brilliant, yep. That would be good. Carenza's trench should help us locate both the back wall of the house and the moat. We need to know the dimensions of the house before we can work out where the Great Hall would have been. If the fire didn't totally destroy the house, this is where we should get an idea of the richness of the site. If trench three is at the back of the house, and we now believe that trench one is part of the Tudor moat at the front, we know the building sits between these two points. 
are you getting on? Excellent. We've actually got the top of the arch here, Carenza. Look, you can see it's coming up, it's going over, and it's going back down the other side. And That's it fantastic. is. It's actually an, an enormous void here. I mean, it's just as Eddie remembers it. Look, you can see it's going <laughs> right the way. <laughs> eh? Come back. <laughs> Come back. You can see it's going right in underneath there. Would you have any idea about a date based on the bricks? It's obviously not modern, is it? No, it looks Georgian or earlier. Do you think they could be Elizabethan or Tudor? Well, if they're smaller bricks, they certainly could be earlier ones. I mean, there's, there's one there. <laughs> ah. How about that one? That's certainly the right sort of dimension. I think we compared that with the ones that are actually standing in the, in the ruin over there. That, that, that is precisely the right sort of thing we'd be looking for, those narrow bricks. What we want to find out is whether that drain or culvert or whatever we've got yes. out there is built at the same time as this. And what we recently need to do is just get one of these bricks here. And I think the answer is pretty clear is no. That's not. This brick is very thin. This yeah. is, this is, hold that for a second. This brick is one and three quarters inches, roughly. So potentially... And these are two, and these are two. These inches are right. two. So this is an early brick we've got. It's an early brick. All I think we can say is that it was made almost certainly at a different time, different time. to this lot, so yeah. you've got two things going on. Victor's sketching his impression of Eddie's arch. It was probably part of the moat, and we now know it was a few metres away from the main entrance of the Tudor mansion. But what about this thing? This is lovely. This is the, the end. We know it's the end because you can see the bricks all finished flush there. What was it for? Well, it, it, I mean, I think it must be some sort of stormwater culvert. I mean, we were saying this morning whether or not it's a tunnel. It's definitely not a tunnel in that that's not the sort of thing people walk along or crawl along. You can see we're right in the bottom of a slope, and, and Eddie says this area is an absolute swamp without drains. And so I think even in Elizabethan times, they must have had problems with water. So it looks as though this might have been a problem area for a long time. I think it's always been a problem. Although we know it's made of Tudor bricks, we don't know if they were old bricks which were recycled at a later time to make this culvert. So Phil's going to have to carry on looking for clues. Cut it in for a minute. It's a half past five on day one, and our big problem has been that there's been this huge house here at some time in the past, and actually we've found no rubble, no masonry, until now. Katie, what is it you've got? We've got a whole load of bricks here, which seems to be sitting on a lovely, solid piece of masonry. Are these twos of these bricks, do we think? I don't know, but they look pretty... They're the same colour, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, so this might actually be the other side of the door that Stuart and Julian found. Julian? Julian? Yes? This is the door jam. Yeah. And so this might be the other half of it. Julian, do you think that that could be the other side of that? Just about. It's in the same line. I think it may be a bit too close, but it's certainly what we're looking for, the front wall of the, of the house. The front wall? The front wall and the front door of the house. And the house is on that side? I hadn't realised until this moment that the front would be here. Well, the, the front's here, look, looking that way, and you're standing inside the, on the lintel yeah. of the front door. Looking out? Looking in. in. <laughs> How long have we been here? Three quarters of a day. I thought the house was over there. That's why we were digging that culvert. This is an important find. But just in case anybody else is confused, this is where we found the front door. But we aren't having much luck with either the moat or the walls at the back of the house, which is very odd. A vast mansion like Rycote should have left huge foundations in the ground not to mention piles of burnt rubble from the devastating fire. So where is it all? <laughs> I think you've very good. <laughs> Phil, what's going on? Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's water pressure. It's just we've been building it up and building it up, and now it's just suddenly given. Don't go tear that edge, that's all underhanging. So it's what can we do about it? Not a lot, not a lot. It's just going to fill up. We're just going to have to get a pump in the morning. I mean, there is just nothing we can do with that. That's just coming in there. We've had it. There's still no sign of the moat we were hoping to find in Trench 3, so we've decided to see if it's further down the garden. But we are continuing to look for the back wall of the Tudor house in the main part of the trench. Chunk of 
this wall is still standing solid. It's actually still built on the bottom here. There's actually a one, two, three, four courses of it, the looks of it, still standing and it's still going down. But there is a face here, it is finishing there. And, and I think that's, that's difficult to feel, but I, I think it's, it is a butt edge here. It's actually incredible seeing it still built like that, isn't it? So could this be the first sign of the back wall of the Tudor house? In trench two, Katie and her team are making good progress at the front of the house and have just started to uncover some interesting masonry and the odd find. We know there was supposed to have been a great fire here in 1745, but now we've got three trenches open and there's no sign of burning whatsoever, or in truth, much at all. The history that we, we've come across suggests that the house was burnt down in 1745, um, at which point the family just uh, decamped from here and went to Whiteham, um, the uh, Whiteham Abbey. Uh, which is another property they owned. How does this tie in with your historical researches? But the only detail given was the fact that the ten-year-old heir to the Earldom of Abingdon, James Bertie, uh, died in his bed. There's no definite statement as to how much of the house was destroyed, how much went, and whether they rebuilt. Do we know what happened to the family or the house after that? But I've got some leads to stuff in the Bodleian Library, which I hope to follow up, because in the 1770s, the family were paying Capability Brown £2,400, a colossal sum, to landscape the grounds around the house. And I can't believe they would have done that if they hadn't repaired the house and carried on living in it. There's no sign of the fire and no sign of the house, but there must be tons of it somewhere. Simon, have a look at this. That is a wonderful stone foundation in it, stone wall. It's got a nice front, front face to it. And look, it's got this brick facing. And then this brick arch is actually built against it. So the, the, the brick arch is definitely the last thing. I think what you've done is you've solved the mystery. I'm sure. Because yeah. we've got the stone revetment. That's right, remote, that's that stuff there. The which really they faced up really beautifully with, with brick that's this stuff and at a later yeah. date they've decided to fill in the moat and put this archway in to take the water course that's still yeah. running and so what i think we're looking at is this arch coming in when they filled in the moat yeah over the top yeah this culvert's evidence of capability brown's re-landscaping and shows that major work was going on at this site 20 to 30 years after the fire we're all beginning to smell food. Ivan's been preparing us a Tudor banquet, which means I don't think Robin will be going to Oxford tonight. I'm putting some of the sweetmeats we've made on the little sugar roundel or That's trencher. Lovely. After the guests had eaten them, they would turn them over and there'd often be a message or a poem on the back. Mm -hmm. so they'd pass around the company and read them out. Frequently love poetry, which linked in with some of the foods. For instance, this true lover's knot, uh -huh. an emblem of, of assignation. Um, and the aphrodisiac comforts and the kissing comforts. <laughs> so a lot of the foods were connected with the idea of love. The banquet was sometimes a time for secret assignations when lovers would meet in a banqueting house in the garden. You don't know how appropriate that is, because Elizabeth and the court came here so often that it's inconceivable that Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester, who was her favourite, of course, and lived very, very close to here, would not have accompanied her. And they may very well have exchanged messages such as this. And on one occasion, in 1582, we know jolly well that he was sent on in advance to tell the lady of the house, Marjorie Norris, that the Queen wouldn't be coming. And she was so furious, after all the vast expenditure on sweetmeats and everything, that she packed him off to spend the night in the stables instead of accommodating him in the guest room. <laughs> I mean, the ingredients were very expensive. There was gold and there was musk from the Himalayas, but it was sure. also the intensive labour of decorating. But in 1588, Dudley writes his last letter to the Queen from your old lodging at Reichert. He dies five days later. And the Queen is so touched by this that she writes his last letter on the back of it, and after her death, it's found in the jewel case by her bedside. Testimony to one of the greatest loves that never found fruition. What do you reckon that is, Simon? Well, I'm pretty sure, if we're right, and this is the entrance of the house, that we're looking at the abutment of this bridge here. That... What do you mean abutment? The abutment is the bit where the bridge springs off. So the abutment would be just about here, and it has to be so big to come right over the moat. 
But isn't it rather big to perform such a small task, just getting over a moat? Well, the moat's probably quite wide. It's probably about sort of 15, 20 foot wide, and so yeah. you're going to have to have a you know, considerable span coming across here, and you need huge foundation. You've got a massive foundation there. Look at those great lumps of stone. I'm sure that's man enough to do the job. I'm sure that's what it is. Look what we just found now. It's just the front of the house. Can you see? Along there. Excellent. And it's a very, very sharp edge, isn't it? Is it, is it a single piece of stone there? No. Oh, I don't know, actually. It's a massive piece of stone by the looks of it. That's great. I was beginning to think we wouldn't find anything left of our Tudor house, but now we've got the front wall and the foundations of the bridge, and we can begin to get an idea of the scale of the house. Right, lads, let's insert bold cam up the culvert. Oh, we're moving. Moving. Oh, oh, look at that. Hey, that is quite amazing. It's look at the beautiful arch on that. Isn't that beautifully incredible. made? Yeah, Can we just think lovely. how many thousands of bricks there must be in there? <laughs> Jamie, how far do you reckon you're in? I reckon it's gone about 25 feet. So that's about, what, about eight, eight metres? Something like that, yeah. God, I'm glad I didn't that's have to climb fantastic. up there. Go on. So this is where the Abingdons spent their money. They paid Capability Brown £2,400 to re-landscape the gardens. That's over a quarter of a million pounds in today's money. But no one would spend a fortune building a culvert this long to make attractive gardens if there wasn't a house to go with it. So this suggests the house was rebuilt after the fire. And sure enough, we're beginning to find some evidence of that in the trench at the back of the house. Simon, have you any idea what date this coin might be? We've oh. just found it in the sort of infill, the rubble there. Is that any help? I think we need to clean it up a bit more. There's a, there's a. You can see the line where a, the yeah. date's underneath there's it. There's a nine there. Yeah, I'm tempted to say it looks like 1949 or something, but I don't think oh, it it's is. It's not that late, is it? Surely. <laughs> of course, it's not pulling your leg. <laughs> We've got Britannia. What date did Britannia first appear on these coins? I think no, right. Charles II. But Charles II. Oh, right. So that's a long. Okay. One. So. Yes, I thought you could see the shield. Yeah, you've got her trident or whatever. Now, we've got George. He looks like George III to me. Oh, no, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Georgius II. The second? The second is even earlier. Oh, no, wait a minute. No, what date was he? George II. Um, he's in the 1730s, isn't he? 1727. Well, when was that fire? When was the fire? Wasn't that the 1740s? So there you the are. The fire that's supposed to. Be, so is this, is this rubble from the rebuilding of the house after the fire? We can now date the coin to 1752, so that's further confirmation that at least part of the house must have been rebuilt after the fire. But if the walls in Carenza's trench are Georgian, like Phil's so culvert, why did they the spend money restoring the house very... and then pull it down soon after? Is that a floor you've got coming up there? I think it could be, yes. While we try to puzzle that one out, we need to get a better look at what was the grand heart of the Tudor house. Bill, I'm getting really frustrated. <laughs> We're halfway through our dig, and so far all we seem to have done is nibbled away at the outsides of the building, and we haven't got into the real meat of it. Yeah, but we've had to find the full extent and get the ground plan. There was no point going into the middle before we knew where we were. Well, now we know where we are, can we get in the middle? Well, that's what we're talking about. I think so, yes. Uh, we've got... Good results here from the geophysics. We've got the high resistance here, which is, I think, the pathway coming up to an entranceway. That's possibly the entranceway into the banqueting hall. This little rectangular That's right, here, that's yeah. right. That looks like the entrance. And this area of high resistance could also be part of that banqueting hall. So where on the ground are we going to dig these trenches? Well, the first one will be over by the, the trunk here. Over here? Yeah. I mean, we've got the wall line. This is the building here. So this is out in the garden? Out into the garden that way. And we think some sort of entrance way here, so a trench through here to and start with. And this is with. where your little lobby might That's be. That's right, yeah. leading into the hall on the inside, now on the inside, yeah. and we want to further investigate that with a second trench back here, about here. And somewhere in this area here should be our banqueting hall. Yes, we hope. Three, four, five triangle? Oh, wow. Yeah, I know. So at last we're going to get a chance to see if we can find the Great Hall, the most important room of the house, if Phil ever manages to untie his knots. Looking Won't be long, Mick. Mm -hmm. Well, they could act, look, there's nothing to stop them cutting round there. Oh, there is, Phil. You just want to move it if I start cutting it. No, I won't. You will. I won't. I'll wait until you finish, Phil. Look, if you cut round those <laughs> eight metres, we'll just move that bit of string. <laughs> uh, there's no point in rushing into these things, Phil. Oh, but there is. Because five minutes later, the rain starts to tip down. Going up, polythene over us. Mm -hmm. 
Solid. Solid. Look, never say. mind that. Keep going. And it's only a drop of rain. Rain so much John? Got something, Phil. <laughs> Oh, wow. that, <laughs> eh? oh that's, that's in place, isn't it? Yeah, you bet it is. I thought it was here, you know, when I was cutting the turf, you just go straight through, clunk, oh, clunk, clunk. clunk. Hoo -hoo. Ah. Sorry. That's all right, that's all right. I wonder if we've got a fireplace. The more... Give me time. Well, come on, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Don't be crowd. <laughs> Here, Phil, come over here, come have a look at this. What? That's in situ as well, isn't it? We've got dirt in between. Oh, Phil, what have you found here? Oh, oh, look at that. Tile, isn't it? How brilliant. Yeah, that's tile, look. With yes, a glazed surface on it, yeah. Look, there's another one there. And another one there, they're broken in situ. And they're the wrong but, way But up. they're face down, <laughs> they're <laughs> face down. Oh dear. <laughs> And we're also finding a wealth of pottery in the trench at the back of the house that we'll need to get cleaned before we can get an expert to take a look at it. It's ceramic. Yeah. It's curved. I think it's a vessel, Barney. I think, look, judging by, there's another huge piece here yeah. down here. It's a nice bit. Yeah, yeah it's fantastic, yeah. isn't it? We've brought in tile expert Maureen Meller from the Ashmolean. Phil, it looks as if these are almost in situ. The only trouble is that we actually know, because we've seen one of them, that they're actually it's face down, because one of them, we've got this rather nice piece here. And look, it's got a green glaze on it. Well, it has, hasn't it? It's partly green and partly brown, as that hasn't quite fired properly. So well, what date do you think this is? Well, if I could see a whole one, this would be much easier. Right, well, the size of that is going to tell us that it's actually post-medieval in date. Oh, look, there's mortar underneath yeah. there, too. Terrific. That orange glaze is really lovely. That's quite definitely, Phil. That's second quarter of the 17th century, so 1625, Is this the sort of tile that would have been on the floor when Charles I came and stayed here? Could have been, could have been. This is typical of the sort of things you see in the paintings of um, Vermeer, um, of sort of 1640s in the Low Countries. What, the sort of checkerboard? The checkerboard, pack. that's right, where you get two colours, and you've got two colours here, which is the orange and the green. They may not be Tudor, but they were obviously highly fashionable and would have looked magnificent when they were on the floor of the Great Hall. We're extending our survey in the garden, where we're looking for more of the moat in the area near the ruined tower on the west wall of the house while Stuart's plotting out the east wall, so he tells us. And Phil continues his search for more evidence of the Tudor Hall in Trench 4. And back by the front door in Trench 2, there's another part of the jigsaw. What do we think this thing is here? This is a narrow plinth that was the base to one of those very slender decorative towers that ran up the face of the building. With a little stairway in? No, probably not. Probably just absolutely solid bit of masonry with a pinnacle on the top. Mm. Have you got well, the... Yeah, what it, it shows on this drawing. Here, Tony, that's the stair turret that survives. There's a doorway. On either side of the doorway are these decorative towers. This is our tower here, and it's got the same angle as the other towers. It's purely decorative, but what it does do is confirm where we are in the building. From this, we can measure exactly the size of this facade. We still think this is the abutment for the bridge. Yeah. And this stone is probably the only stone from the abutment that's still in situ, the face stone. Oh, this I is see. Core. This is, yeah, yeah, this you wouldn't have core. seen any of that. No. Yeah. The really important thing about the whole of this trench is that it gives us the ability now to measure out and reconstruct the whole facade. Because measuring from that little corner there over to the turret over there gives us a module, and that module enables us to recreate the whole facade. So Trench 2 has confirmed not only the location of the front wall, but the bridge that led up to it and one of the pinnacle towers that would have flanked the front door. Carenza? Oh, hi there. I, I don't understand. I thought this trench was about finding the end of the Tudor building, and now it's turned into an open-cast mine. <laughs> well, it still is about finding the end of the Tudor building, but doing that turned out to be really rather more difficult than we thought. Isn't this it? That's what we hoped when we first found it, covered with the rubble spread. But in fact, it's Georgian. How do you know it's Georgian? 
Well, from the bricks, I mean, this is a Tudor brick from the demolition layer, and this is a Georgian brick. You can see how different they are, the mm. thickness. So there's no getting away from the fact it is Georgian, which seemed to be a great pity, but we decided to extend on, just run a very narrow slot right up the edge of the trench, just to see if we could find anything else. Here we finally got the back wall. I mean, it's fantastic stone blocks, really well built. It's course here, another brick there, another course underneath there. But if you've achieved what you set out to do, why is Barney still beavering away on the far side of it? The other thing we really wanted to know was whether there was a moat up against the Tudor building. And much further down, we extended the trench and found this whole layer of clay which had been laid down in a series of layers that looked like the water had laid it down, but there was pottery below it, Tudor pottery below the clay. And we wanted to know how far back towards the building it came. And we've now discovered that it seems to have come right up to this building so not only do we know where the back wall of the building was, we know there was a moat beyond it, and we know that this must have been inside the Tudor building. We've just completed a survey on the west side of the house, and we found signs of a moat there too, so we've decided to put a fifth trench in. And so we don't waste time, we've decided to get the turf off tonight, so that first thing tomorrow morning, we can start trench five. And as we've all worked up quite a thirst, Ivan's been preparing some hippocras for us. It's an Elizabethan cordial made from red wine and exotic spices like seeds of paradise from Africa and Javan long pepper. It was only drunk at special occasions, and what better time than now? Ivan, why have you made little perfect nuts? Well, if you open them up, you'll find there's a message inside. Yeah. Ooh. And Ooh. you can read it out. Ooh. Ooh. My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. What does yours say? <laughs> there is in some perfumes more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Cheers! Cheers! Beginning of day three, and Carenza's already making good progress with our new trench. We're hoping to find more of the moat. And if it's there, it's so close to the wall of the Great Hall, we're hoping to get some good finds that fell in. I think that's archaeology. So if we stay at that, that depth there and just pull it back. And in the hall trench, Phil's still looking for more evidence of the Great Hall of the Tudor House. But he's just beginning to find the remains of a wall which might be from an even earlier medieval house. We want to know how wide the house was, and our new trench should find the moat on the west wall. Meanwhile, Stuart's finished making his calculations, and he's sure he's already worked out how wide it is, so he's set up his theodolite to show us where the southeast tower should have been. So what I've done is set out a right angle now, so that should be the line of the east wall. Right. So, it, you know, question now, we've got one trench here which isn't far over mm. enough. Mm. And there's another trench over there which isn't right. far over enough. Yeah. So we're going to extend this trench and see whether there's any evidence of it. Right. So Phil and his team are extending trench four to see if they can find the east wall of the house where Stuart's calculations predict it should be. Robin's back from Oxford and has come back with evidence which explains far more clearly than anyone could have thought exactly what happened here after the fire. This picture from Corpus Christi in Oxford, dated 1773, shows the house still standing 38 years after the fire supposedly burnt it to the ground. But most remarkably, Robin can now tell us exactly what happened and when. I've come up with two sale catalogues that I think demonstrate the final stages of the house being demolished and so on. Go on. The first one, in 1779, is an account of the sale of all the furniture in the house, formerly belonging to the Earl of Abingdon. Then we come to the second sale catalogue. This one is dated 1807, mm -hmm. and by this date, they are selling uh, the entire building, lock, stock and barrel, in bits. Mm -hmm. Capital building materials in lots to be pulled down. And again, room by room, we have the sash windows, the finely carved doors, and in the margin, the prices that they all fetched. Did this often happen, that you would actually yeah. sell the very fabric of a house in order to pay debts? I think this is quite extraordinary. Yeah. I, mean, I've, I mean, you might pull down a building, but actually to sell it... And what we appear to have here is they're selling it room by room. Yes. I mean, they're even selling the wallpaper, canvas and paper, <laughs> in the chamber over the salting room. The skirting boards, the doors, the fireplaces. Oh, no. 
It's like the entire wind. building is being asset stripped mm. yes. to sell off for um, for recycling. It's quite a, this really is a very very unusual document. Another puzzle to me is actually if they demolish the building brick by brick and sold it off, is that why did they actually leave the tower? Well, I suspect that not everything sold. In fact, it, yes. Look, this one here, this says outside brickwork and stone to entrance front from the tower to the stu steward's room. Uh -huh. So they were actually selling it in sectors. Really? And perhaps what we've got is one of those sectors actually left. Uh, left. Have we any idea why they did it? Well, they were obviously very hard up. Mm. At around the same time, they're also flogging off all the Earl's racehorses. Uh, what amounts to his own personal stud here goes successively in lots. Do we know where any of these lots might have ended up? I've got a clue in a, a volume about Tame that yes. I was looking at yes. that certain of the material turns up in houses in Tame. Yes, we have heard that too. Uh-huh. Mm. Have you any idea where? Well, there's one house which may, I, I gather, have a fireplace in it. Julian? Yes? Could you nip over there and have a look? I think we better. <laughs> let's, go and, let's go and find it. And talking of finds... What do you think that's Simon? Is that, is that Tudor? Looks like it, doesn't it? Couldn't it be upright, be a jam, rather than Let's, a... let, let's put it up and see. Uh. Oh, hang on, it's just got paint, paint on there. Oh, I was looking at it, so oh, yeah. I thought it had some yeah, paint. Yeah, there we are. So, in fact, what we're looking at is probably a window that goes like that. And then with oh, a diamond yeah. pattern for the lead. You were on the inside here. This is on the inside. With the paint. And this is on the, the outside. outside. And it goes into brick. And outside, it goes into brick probably. inside here. We're probably a big, maybe a big bay window or something here. Yeah. Is yeah. this actually plastered, this surface? It I looks think incredibly so, yeah, there's... smooth. Perhaps layers and layers of lime wash. Just accumulation. Just accumulation. And then this, this lovely red pigment, I'm which is incredible. How bright that is. It's I mean, look at the of that. There it is. There's the fireplace that you've come Gosh. to see. <laughs> oh, gracious. Now, do you think that's of the right period? It's later than a lot of things we've been looking at at the Ryker, but it's certainly, um, it certainly dates from before the sale. How can you tell that? Well, it looks... There's just a touch of Rococo here and there, so it looks mid-18th century. Um, it's very grand for a townhouse. I mean, we're in a fine 18th century townhouse, but this really is sort of country house quality. Um, and there's some very detailed carving here. Swags down the side, almost as if they're Grinling Gibbons. So you definitely say there's no chance that this was built for this house? That's pretty unlikely, I think, given the size and scale of it. Oh, what about these? Oh, well, there's some more. It's the overdoors. They're also Rococo, you see, in the, um, the sort of curves of those, um, the leaves at the bottom. And we've got some very heavy doors. These are decent doors, but with rising hinges and a moulding round them. Would the, these have been made for this house or could these also have been part of a job? Well, again, they're, they're certainly of country house quality. And in that sale catalogue, when they talked about selling the doors, I mean, this is, this is what you would have bought. You would have bought the door and the frame and, and the moulding above it. This is precisely how the house would have been taken apart. These doors date from the 1750s, so the house must have been refurbished at the same time as the walls in Trench 3 were being rebuilt. Back in Trench 5, we're straight back to the Tudor house. We're now beginning to find a large amount of stained glass. It probably would have come from the huge windows in the Great Hall. And although we're only finding fragments, it dates from the medieval right through to the late 16th century. And it's all top quality. So we've basically got two types of glass, haven't we? We've got this very thin, very thin sheets of glass. Yeah, that's later, I think, isn't it? And that's, that's all just, just murky and yeah. clear. And having had a look through all this stuff, the most interesting things seem to be these terracotta pots, I think they are, aren't they? Yes, they are. I mean, they're huge garden pots. We've got nothing like that. It's stunning. Lovely design. Look at that. That's a real Renaissance classic, isn't it? And then, presumably, these would have been great big terracotta urns in the garden. Oh, yes. Yes, enormous urns. Well, hold it, because um, we've got the inventory that was discovered earlier, and we've got a number of pots listed. Listen to this. One fine large orange tree in a tub, but two in pots. One large myrtle, four small ditto, four geraniums, one balm of Gilead. And look, uh, ditto, ditto, ditto. And if you, you add all these up, there's probably about 50 pots mentioned in total. Now, I think one survives. <laughs> because okay. if we go over to the bushes over here, <laughs> we will see something that right. um, I think is really rather interesting. <laughs> okay. Now, it's in here, balancing on the top of the wall. And I think it's probably lost its... It's foot, but what, what, what do you think, Maureen? 
Well, it's not quite the same, is it? The actual decoration isn't, and maybe this is a tiny bit larger. I think it's a larger pot. It's perhaps one of the ones for your orange trees or something. That's the um, haunting tower that's shown. Bill, is that wall medieval like we hoped? It is medieval. We're sure of that. Not only does it look like a medieval wall, it's got the bit, parts of the Tudor mansion on top of it. We found these little bits of pottery. This is actually the top of a medieval bottle. This is a piece of earthenware. And this piece here, you see, quite nicely made. It's fine bodied with green, green lead glaze. It's a, it dates the wall to the 14th or 15th century. It's really good. I think there's substantial buildings here before the Tudor mansion on this site. Probably they were demolished wholesale before the Tudor mansion was built. It seems to be going off at that sort of angle. That's right. It's on a different alignment to the alignment of the Tudor mansion. So what alignment is the Tudor mansion? Well, yeah. this is the alignment of the yeah. Tudor mansion, Tony. This there's is... nothing there! <laughs> <laughs> well, there's nothing there now because they've robbed it all away. But funnily enough, you can actually still see where the wall was. If I make my shadow, can you see that line down there? Well, the change in the colour. There's the a soil. change in the colour between that side and that side. On that side is where the actual wall of the Tudor mansion would have been. And it's running straight down there. Does this fit with where you thought this wall was? It's bang on. Can you see the line of poles up there? Yeah. Trench, pole here, it's bang on the alignment. And it also lines up with the wall in the far trench as well. Bang on. All along, Stuart's used the kip engraving to predict where we'd find the east wall and has shown how precise it was. Barney, it's getting on now. Uh, looks like we might have the moat fill here. Yeah, I think that we have. Those clays down there that you can see are almost certainly water lane. Yeah, it does look alluvial, doesn't it? It yeah. does. That lends in. And it's silted up yeah. completely naturally. Yeah. Absolutely. And that means that we're outside the Tudor Palace. Right. Great. And the moat yeah. carries on through here, so it's at least eight metres wide. Appears in the section here. All right. Um, we were expecting to find the Tudor wall of the palace because of Stuart's ranging rods and the alignment, but there's no sign of a Tudor wall and that's because it's been completely destroyed by these uh, plinths, probably of the 1740s, certainly Georgian, that have completely taken it out, because mm. down there I think we've got a cellar. Yeah. They're massive, aren't they? That's yeah. way down below yeah, ground right. level. Yeah, it, it looks, Barney, like these plinths probably support a vaulted roof. Yeah. So we're well below floor level here of the 18th century mansion, aren't That's we? what I think, yeah. 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 We did find one piece of the palace, but it wasn't actually in situ. And that is this window mullion. Oh, oh, look at that. And this one's got lime wash on it. Yeah, yeah so did the other one have. Yeah. God, I can't Sorry. get one. <laughs> <laughs> um, where's the corner turret? Ah. We've got a corner turret. <laughs> on that in the corner of the building? Uh, I don't know. You haven't found that yet. Because the drawings show the corner turrets pushed forward of the yes. building lines, I suspect it's beyond the trench over, over right. there, perhaps by the tree or nearby. Well, because what's, what's in marvellous now is that we've got such a variety of foundations of the house. Mm. Over by the front door there, we've got the real, mm. the real Tudor stone yeah. foundations with a brick on top of it. Down in Phil's trench, mm -hmm. we've had a robber trench with nothing in it at all. Yeah. And here we've got a great 18th yeah. century rebuild. Yeah. And we've got um, 14th, 15th century stone walls yeah. as well. <laughs> and that, that as well. <laughs> Don't forget the medieval. So <laughs> it's not a simple story. It's not a single phase. There's all yeah. sorts of oh, things happening. Yeah. Oh, That's right. It's amazing that they preferred... Yeah. And the richness of this site is completed in Carenza's new so trench. Yeah. Because we've got this whole incredible array of building materials. In fact, you can tell the whole story of the house through this, from the really early tiles, the 16th century tiles, 17th century tiles. We've got enough here almost to rebuild the whole blooming house. What's this one? That's a pen tile, and that's a fleur-de-lis decoration. It's a tile of the 14th, 15th century, made about 10 miles away at Penn. Um, and this particular decoration is absolutely classic of that. And then we found another one too. I love that. I think that's Isn't beautiful. It? And that beautiful is, one. is a stag. I can't see it at all. <laughs> no, look at those antlers. The front leg, back leg. Oh, yes, 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 yes. That's yes, right. Yes. And then it's running through the forest. It's rather fat. Yes. <laughs> rather <Fat> fat. <laughs> and it's got flowers of the forest round about it. Yeah. This was a deer park. So all of this would have perhaps tied in with the uh, family interests. This is rather beautiful. And that's 16th century, and gone are now the sort of gothic pictures that you get of animals and fleur-de-lis, and they're going to these rather more geometric types, and you get sort of two colours coming in. We've also found masses of this stained glass, some more of the window fragments as well, the masonry from the fragments. But the window glass is just beautiful with um, cherubs' faces and angels' wings on it, absolutely lovely.
We've used our Tudor finds from the moat trench to reconstruct the Great Hall as it appeared in Elizabethan times. This was the grandest room in the house and everything would have been designed to impress from the decorative stained glass to the beautiful geometric tiles on the floor. A fitting place to entertain royal guests with feasting and music. We now know that this door would have been a window and that the house was 60 foot wide and protected by a large moat. We found the bridge that spanned it and the main entrance flanked by its decorative towers. Time Team came here to find this lost palace, but surprisingly we also found an earlier medieval house and evidence of rebuilding after the fire. But uniquely, we were able to unearth the truth behind the disappearance of the Great Rycote Park. Next, over on Home and Leisure, work begins on the main stations as Simon Farmer continues building his model town. Meanwhile, here on Discovery Channel, Mark Williams looks at the rise of water-powered cotton mills in industrial revelations.